Hello, good afternoon and welcome to our latest in a series of webinars. Today we're looking at regional general practice webinars uh, focusing on Ayrshire and Arran, NHS Borders, Dumfries and Galloway and Lanarkshire. We've got a, an exciting programme for you this afternoon and we're going to just run through a bit of housekeeping before we get underway. So basically you'll all be on mute, uh, the people that have joined us this afternoon. Um, we appreciate you joining uh, to spend some time with us today as it's very busy out there in uh, health and care land and we also appreciate our speakers taking the time to share their experiences today as well with us. Please use the Q&A section on the toolbar in your uh, Teams live event meeting. This will enable you to ask questions, make comments or share your use of near me or if you have answers to any questions that people have posed, please put those in as well. The session will be recorded today, so if um, you have colleagues that weren't able to come or you'd like to review some of the Q&A session or the content afterwards, you can do that. It will be on our YouTube channel within a day or so. A lot of the links we're going to share in the chat and on the slides will be available in the resource sheets along with a summary of the Q&A at the end. Just to get people using the Q&A, it'd be great to hear um, what profession you're from and where you're um, joining us from today. It'd be super to get to know our audience a bit better uh, this afternoon. There are some accessibility options if you require them in, within Microsoft Teams Live events where you can have subtitles. If you click on the three dots in your toolbar, you'll be able to add in subtitles and some settings in around those as well. Hopefully you'll be able to see and hear as clearly. If for some reason you do lose signal and it deteriorates, please leave the session and rejoin. Or find a machine or get nearer some better Wi-Fi signal. Alternative, you can directly connect to a network with an Ethernet cable, for example. That will help you uh, maintain good um, connection to us. So this afternoon, uh, my name is Mark Beswick, I'm the National Lead for the NME Network and I'm joined by my colleague Rachel Burke today, who's the Technology Enabled Care Programme Manager. Rachel's going to be monitoring the Q&A, answering some of your questions throughout, but she'll be collating the questions specifically aimed at our panellists this afternoon. We're delighted to have Dr Scott Jameson joining us today. He's the Executive Officer for Quality Improvement for the Royal College of General Practitioners and a GP himself in NHS Tayside. We'll also be joined by Pauline Brown, who's an AMP at Castle Douglas Medical Group in an NHS Dumfries and Galloway, and also Dr David Stevenson from Bank for Medical Practice in NHS Ayrshire and Arran. Please do follow us on Twitter. We'd like to engage with our audiences and professionals on Twitter, so you can follow NHS at NHS near me or at Mark Bezik AHP myself. And also, if we'd like to put hashtags into your tweets around hashtag near me, GP near me or health centre near me and that helps tie everything together. Uh, we're also helped by David Bath today. He is a producer from the National VC team, so he's going to keep everything running smoothly in the background. So today we are um, going to be looking at how we strive to offer near me appointments as a choice of patients. We'll be showcasing some examples from primary care across Scotland and also exploring some of the challenges that that poses and how those have been overcome. And there will be a chance to ask questions of the panellists and ourselves at the end. Um, we aim to have that for a reasonable amount of time towards the end. And again, please use the chat in the meantime and the Q&A to communicate with us. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr Scott Jameson now, who is going to give you uh, an overview of the national picture related to uh, near me in Scotland. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak again, Mark. It's been a great pleasure to be able to support this series of, of webinars across Scotland. Um, and certainly from a college perspective, uh, we have been linked in with the Near Me project, um, I think since probably last summer, maybe. Um, and it was a great pleasure to support uh, your predecessor, Mark, um, in, a, in a number of ways of how, how, we've, how we've brought this together. And certainly, Near me was 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 so much more than just providing the platform and providing the the the, the kit. And for general practice, um, when we work in in a, a, such a strong relationship based um, care environment, um, it's really key that we um, 
uh, work collaboratively together to, 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 to develop solutions to support patients. And so um, a brand new way of consulting really for us was was needing um, more than, than, than what would, uh, would, would have initially been considered. And so we worked really closely to develop a series of, of, of documents and guidance with the Near Me team, um, and they'll be posted in the chat, I'm sure, by Rachel, um, to, to help general practice um, and other primary care settings understand where it could be used. The way that we developed these um, was to pilot in, in, in practices and in settings across out of hours and in care homes and in, in GP practices to see where and how you could use it within long term conditions, within acute care. And it was really positive. Um, the, the patients were, were liking it and, and the practices were seeing something that they, they didn't think that, that existed. Um, I, I really do miss seeing patients in person um, as much as we used to. And um, it's really warming when you then look at the, the public engagement that was conducted. Again, we can put a link in the chat, but I think 5,000 respondents on that. And when you look at the, some of the, the granularity of the detail within there, not only do patients prefer it much more than we think they might, uh, I suspect, but actually um, patients value seeing the person that they speak to. Um, and that's something which um, seems obvious. Um, it's like, it's like FaceTiming my sister um, as much as uh, um, you, you might think that, that it's, uh, you know, in practical terms, what do you gain over a conversation? I think that interaction, seeing facial expressions, um, there's some emerging RCT data, um, which I might try and find for you, Mark, um, about patients randomised to um, uh, normal consultations and, and with face coverings um, with PPE on. And in fact, those that are, are having consultations um, 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 uh, without the PPE and, uh, and virtually actually felt more engaged with the clinician than they did um, for those that, that saw them in person but had to wear PPE and um, you know maintain a, a distance. So it was a, it's an interesting emerging kind of uh, bit of data, but it's, uh, it certainly fits a little bit with, with, with my own experience. Um, we in practice actually, um, you know, I, I have full pre-booked days of, of, of near me. We have mornings of 15 minute appointments, um, but actually um, we, 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 we might do um, uh, like a quarter of the clinic is a near me and then we'll do uh, our third of the clinic near me. We might do a few seat in person and then we might do a few phone calls, but very much it's it's moved in in my practice to be part and parcel of the offering. Um, and that fits in with kind of how the college sees this, um, which is that it's a choice. Um, we are very loath to see digital poverty or accessibility um, being an issue and certainly nobody should be forced to consult a near me that, that doesn't want to. But what I would equally say is that nobody should be forced to, to not have the access to this medium if they wish it. Um, be that now with 650,000 near me consultations and above um, completed, there are more and more people that are utilising this method when they're in outpatients, when they're um, contacting a flow hub through the, the, the new emergency department and uh, 111 access points, people are getting more and more used to this being a, a way that they wish to interact with, 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 with medical services. And as a clinician, um, I, I really want to engage with that because um, I, I want to offer things that patients seem to want to engage with. And, and 650,000 is a number that, that can't be shied away from. Um, there is more to do, as I said, I think we need to make sure that those that can't access it in their own homes for IT or digital literacy issues are enabled to do so in community settings, um, be that if they have a tertiary centre cardiology you know, valve replacement clinic appointment on near me, they can go and do that somewhere, which is a setting for which has privacy and has access and support to let them have that clinic appointment, because why should they be moved on to telephone and um, if they don't want to travel 200 miles to see somebody in person. Um, so th there should be other things that we can do here to improve it. But um, we are really pleased to support this market. So it's a really good way to interact with your patients. It helps pre-planned care, 15 minute appointments and, and really nice to engage with patients in a different format, which I know and I can see from the public feedback that they, they do value. Thanks very much. Mark, I think you're still on mute. Sorry, I, I muted you during it because I was getting feedback from your mic. My apologies. <laughs> so please, don't 
There you okay. are. Your Apologies for that. I, I'm <laughs> struggling. I'm struggling to move from my team settings through to the PowerPoint. So yeah, apologies for that, everybody. So yes, thank you, Scott, for um, summarising that for us and stressing that the importance of collaboration and choice for patients, collaboration between staff and choice of patients, and also equality of access, again, which is something we're acutely aware of. Um, so what I'd like to do now, hopefully, is introduce um, Pauline Brown to you. Um, I'm going to just, hopefully, Pauline is here. Can I just confirm that with David? Got very quiet. Let me just check. Okay, so it looks like we're having we're struggling to get uh, Pauline to join us on Teams. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to uh, other presenter, Dr. David Stevenson. So I will just get his slides queued up, and then. Over to you, David. Let me just put back on presenter view and go to that. Okay. Are you good to go then, uh, David? How's that for you? Uh, yeah, that's absolutely fine. I'm good to go. I can't see any slides, it has to be said. Okay. I can Let see the Near Me Network front page slide. Okay. All right, then let me just reshare that. Bear with me a minute, people. Let's try this. Perfect, yeah. OK. OK, so um, now my name is David Stevenson and I'm a GP in air. I don't have any particular specialist knowledge on uh, near me. I think I'm the, the everyman, the, the GP on the Clapham omnibus. And uh, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of uh, our experiences with the uh, near me technology. Um, I don't seem to be able to get control of the slides, so Mark is very kindly uh, going to advance them for me as I do a Chris Whitty and say the next slide, please. So if we looked at the situation, uh, 365 days ago, if you'd asked me to do this presentation, then uh, what was our um, what were our feelings about um, near me technology? We were aware of it. We knew it was there. Uh, we had been offered it. Uh, it was being um, it was available in Ayrshire and Arden, and there was a consensus that maybe we should be doing something about this. Um, in principle, we were happy with that. But uh, being GPs, we had a thousand other things to do and there was no great rush to move in that direction. If you'd asked us why not, we would have uh, quoted to you, well, we have to spend time setting that up. Uh, we're going to have to train the staff. Do we have to train the patients? Uh, you know, is uh, how, how would the patients react to that? And is that going to take a lot of work? And then there's all the secondary changes, the things that you don't necessarily think of, but you need to uh, change your, your working habits or change the layout of your room or buy some IT or change the website, all that sort of stuff. So we had been in that situation for quite some time, uh, probably a few months at least. And uh, I, I don't know if we'd have moved on from that. Uh, I'm sure we would have at some point. But then, of course, uh, COVID happened and then we went on to the next slide. Uh, and as soon as um, COVID happened, the, it became obvious that this was something we were going to have to uh, move on to. Um, we've since, in the in the year since the, the start of the pandemic, we've made some physical changes to the surgery. So whereby initially we just didn't want to bring anyone into the surgery, we are now able to bring people in. Uh, but to start with, we had a real need for some sort of uh, remote um, consultation tool. Uh, one of us, one GP and the practice manager uh, were, were set up. Uh, we had uh, admin uh, for our local waiting area and we could uh, create accounts for other users. We could show them how to use it. We could uh, create policies and, and such like. Uh, in terms of hardware, we were lucky to get a couple of webcams uh, straight away. We also bought some uh, laptops so we could work from home and uh, if anyone had to try if any of you guys had to try and buy a webcam or a laptop last year they literally went the same way as toilet paper and hand sanitizer i went back on to uh, amazon i think it was to buy some more lap webcams a couple of weeks after i bought the first lot you could not get them for love nor money you uh, you could get cheap 
ten pound webcams that may or may not work. Uh, but the the ones that we bought previously just did not exist. Couldn't get them anywhere. Um, and we changed the uh, we did change all the other stuff we had to change. We were you know, we were making physical changes to the practice anyway. We changed the website. We did all sorts of stuff. So um, that all went relatively well. And once we were forced to do it, it happened. Um, in terms of uh, dragging people along with us, uh, it was some people were enthusiastic. I don't think anyone was really enthusiastic, but most people were relatively enthusiastic. They could see the um, they could see the, the utility of it. A couple of people were a wee bit reluctant. Not for particular reasons, just the same as we all did at the start. It was well, it's a it's a new thing, and do we really have to? Um, and uh, to start with, we would sometimes it's very embarrassing. A patient would phone up and say, "I've been waiting here for twenty six minutes. Why has nobody seen me?" And uh, the person involved, usually me, it had to be said, uh, the the guilty party then realised they actually had a a video clinic that started twenty six minutes prior, and uh, you don't you don't know about that. Uh, if your physical waiting room fills up, someone is very quick to tell you. Uh, nobody really knows if the um, the waiting room has one patient in it or 100 patients, and the patients don't know. We got that sorted. We've now got uh, alarms set and all sorts of stuff. And uh, in terms of IT, no real problems at all. Everything uh, from a technical point of view worked well. The PCs worked well. The webcams worked well. Microphones worked well. We bought some headsets and such like. So but, uh, nothing that you wouldn't expect. It was all fairly um, fairly smooth sailing. Um, what are we doing? Our current situation is that we have regular clinics uh, every day, as um, as Scott said, it's now a regular part of our practice. Uh, we tend to separate it by um, one doctor does video clinics all that morning or all that afternoon. Uh, if the patient wants to physically see a doctor, you know that particular doctor, they would come in on another day when that doctor was doing face to face patients. Um, as, when we see, if you see those 20 patients, probably 17 or 18 of them, that's them. You can deal with it over the, the video. Um, a small number, I don't know the exact number, and it's going to vary from day to day. You just, it becomes obvious when you're talking to them that actually we can't deal with this in the video. We need to bring you in, or maybe you need to email us some photos. Um, uh, phone cameras tend to have lower quality settings for video than they do on still photos. So if people are wanting to take a picture of some interesting skin lesion, they can uh, email it into us. Uh, my personal view is it's uh, it's equivalent to a phone call with the benefit of uh, seeing people. Uh, and as that's already been mentioned, a lot of patients really appreciate seeing your face. Um, my colleagues don't, I don't know, not everyone feels the same way. Uh, you know, you sometimes, I sometimes say, well, look, do you know what, we're busy today. I'll just put in an extra half dozen uh, video clinics, uh, video calls. And they, well, why, why would you do that? You know, you, you might, they might not need seen in a video. They might need seen in a phone call. Well, I'm going to speak to them anyway. I, it's easier for me to speak to them in the video. I find it easier to communicate with them. So let's just, you know, if, if they phone, if they contact us, they need seen and we don't have any video slots left, we have to make a phone call, which is, I think, less you know, less useful. Uh, and at the start, we're not doing this as much now, but right at the start of the pandemic, we just basically shut our doors completely. And our nurse was, uh, you know, all of a sudden her chronic disease management stuff disappeared. So we got her onto it as well. And uh, we did a lot of the chronic disease stuff um, just to keep her ticking over for the first month or so. We worked through the stuff that we thought, do you know what, we could probably manage without physically seeing someone for an epilepsy review and mental health reviews. And maybe the asthmas as well, if they've got a peak flow meter at home and we phone them up, and they're doing well and they can show us a peak flow diary, maybe we don't actually need to see them. So we, we use that for a bit of chronic disease management, although we've, we've now restarted that more physically as well. Uh, patients, a vast, uh, as you would imagine, huge difference between different groups of patients. Uh, th there isn't, I assumed that there would be a nice smooth gradient between people at one end of the curve who are happy to use it and don't need much help, uh, people at the other end of the curve who uh, aren't good at using it or don't want to use it and who need a bit of help. Um, there, there isn't really a smooth transition. No, they, they tend to fall into, the patients tend to fall into two heaps. Uh, there's a big pile of people probably the majority who are very happy to use it and don't have any problems. And there's another big pile of people at the other end who either won't use it or 
can't use it for whatever. Um, and I, that, that's rather harsh what I've said in that uh, slide there. No point spending any time with them. I think what I meant there, there's no point spending any time trying to persuade them to use a video system that they either can't use or don't want to use. Um, so from, from my point of view, when I'm talking to those folk, we just straight away move on to, okay, how, how would you like to be seen? You know, sh should we do a phone call? Should we physically bring you in? Uh, but we certainly don't want to uh, beat them up for not being able to use a, a video system. There's a small heap of people in the middle, a small group of people who are willing to use it, maybe having problems and can be persuaded. Uh, but uh, I think my experience, and I have to stress, it's just anecdotal, is that patients tend to fall into one of the, the two extremes. Uh, a lot of these things here are exactly what you'd expect. Uh, I would assume that we now have a population who are absolutely fantastic at doing Zoom calls because we've all been doing it for the last uh, year and uh, most people pick this up within the first few weeks. Um, we still have a lot of people though who haven't really thought it through and uh, you, you you start the video call that in front of a, all you see is a silhouette sitting in front of a window the camera's continually moving the camera's pointed at the, the ceiling um they've got the wrong camera on and apparently it, there's they've managed to change it but can't change it back uh, you have to jump in very quickly sometimes when they say well i just want to talk to you about this uh, funny rash i've got and then you the camera starts moving in a downward direction and you have to very quickly say, look, I've, I really don't want to, if we're going to look at that rash, we'll, we'll bring it in. We don't really want to be looking that over the video. Thank you very much. But uh, all these are pretty much, most people, it has to be said, are, are very good and we don't have these sort of problems with them. Uh, digital poverty. Uh, yep. Traditionally, people couldn't contact us if they didn't have access to a phone, which nowadays you hardly ever see or couldn't physically come in. The group who can't physically come in, we've now improved access for them. But uh, we now have a new group of people who cannot access the, the video. Now, from our point of view, that's not a problem. We still will provide service to them. We'll just bring them in and such like. But it does seem a shame that uh, they can't access what is a fantastic system. And uh, I'm sure there will be various um, initiatives to reach out to those in the future. And the groups of people who don't do well is, isn't who you would necessarily think. We have, uh, you know, people who, you know, as I say, 80s, 90 year olds who will quite cheerfully come along and uh, chat to you and they, they log on with no problems at all. You have pin sharp video, you can hear every word they say and they use the camera perfectly appropriately. And you have folk in their teens and 20s who apparently don't have any access to the internet and, uh, and can't use it at all. At all. So it's, it's absolutely, there's no stereotyping here. The, the people who can and can't use it uh, are a, a very mixed bunch, maybe down to preference more than anything else. Um, how would we personally improve it? Um, if it works, it works beautifully and you don't notice it. It just works in the background and everything works well. If it doesn't work, we have no way of, of troubleshooting that whatsoever. And it'd be nice if we had something to do about that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, communication, it would be nice to be able to uh, announce things to the whole waiting room. Possibly that's a feature that exists and I haven't found it yet. Uh, and there's not much you'll notice. My, my list of improvements isn't very big. And the last slide, I think, is uh, in terms of, this has nothing to do with the Attend Anywhere um, software, but it's, if we were to, if I wanted to work at home, which in theory I can do if I'm doing a, a video clinic, uh, the, the other leg, the, the back channel, doesn't tend to work as well. It's a different system we're using. We're trying to access our clinical systems remotely. Um, we can't print prescriptions. We can't um, view various documents. There are tons of things that don't work. And I'm quite certain that in a couple of years time that will all be iron ironed out. But at the moment, it's a kind of hodgepodge of various different systems we're using. When we use it in the surgery though, it works extremely well and I would recommend it to anyone. Yeah, very positive experience. And as I say, the list of hiccups is very, very small. So it's, it's, it's if you're if you're toying with the idea of going for it, then go for it. I think that's me, Mark. Thank you very much, David. That's really good. I really uh, like to uh, a very honest account of your um, practical approach 
that you've used there in practice. Uh, and again, that's you know, like a like a phone, but you can see them and, and asking that question, how would you like to be seen today? That's really key, I think. And um, and again, the, the, the assumptions that have been challenged by which types of patients we think will or won't um, be able to use near me or not has, has been um, has been you know, really quite enlightening, I think, for, for professionals. Um, and I'm uh, very relieved to see uh, Pauline there, I think, in the background. So that's super to see Pauline. Thank you. We've managed to get you in eventually. That's super. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go back to Pauline's slides and we'll hopefully queue her up. So I'm going to just. Well, actually, we just had an introductory slide for Pauline, so I'll just pull that up now. And let me just get this back up. So I'll hand over to you, Pauline. Thank you very much. I'm going to just mute myself because I'm struggling yeah. to move between my screen and yours. So thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I do apologise. Down in the recent gallery had some major IT uh, um, problems and apologise. I missed all the introductions. So I just want to say thanks to Mark for inviting me. Um, so who am I? I'm Pauline Brown. I work as an advanced nurse practitioner in a rural practice in Castle Douglas, uh, famous for the gallery belties, unlike Dr Jimison up in the Kerry Muir uh, gingerbreads up there. The, the, um, I have worked here in for the last 45 years and we are local hospital is 26 miles away. So my role is involved in uh, doing um, lots of triage in the morning. Previous to that I was a health visitor, a district nurse and midwife. So it took a COVID pandemic to actually start to get us to use NHS, attend anywhere. And our understanding of is to an aim to improve health and social care. And I have to say it's it's um, been an absolute change of mindset between us all. We are a training practice um, and it's been a case of gaining confidence in using the system. And uh, I'd just like to use some examples of a way back in the beginning last last um, February when we, 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 sorry, March, when we started using it. Um, so if you forgive me for a minute, just because I had some IT skills. Yeah, it, so, so the daily triage would be routinely um, through from the receptionist into, into us and it could be vary, varying from chest, rash, pneumonia, anything, anything like that. Or we could have something with a, somebody funnily had a problem down below well, the problem wasn't really down below in a vagina. It was the neighbour down below. Her husband had been having a little dalliance with the neighbour down below. So we did need to go down below. Um, but for for me, it's about um, really making making a difference to our patients in the rural areas. Uh, as with all, probably, I'm sorry, I missed what you said already. The the elderly, it is a barrier, the struggle to use the IT and our connection, as we've just demonstrated, has been extremely poor. So we have problems with IT. Um, we we uh, would would never replace face to face, um, but it has been invaluable in connecting with our patients. And I don't know if everybody else finds, but where, certainly when the patient does connect with us, they almost relax straight away, seeing our faces as though we're actually in in the patient's home and we're able to to really connect with them. Um, and forgive me, I'm just trying to find some of my examples, but I can't get to my phone. Um, yeah, uh, we've also increased the use of it using our the practice nurses. So for the chronic disease management, and we had a funny patient the other day at the the practice nurse was trying to take the history of it. Do you when they had respiratory problems and do you have asthma? No, but my neighbour Jimmy next door has it. So that was really useful. <laughs> um, the the um, sorry the the next thing um, would be I think looking back 
chatting to Grace de Braille, our director, assistant director, was saying that in Defuse and Galloway we were quite early adopters uh, of the system. As mentioned, it took a COVID pandemic for us to start to use it, not because of any fear, it's just we had never been used to using it. So now we use it on a daily basis and it's about for me, stepping back and just taking time on that daily triage. We have in our template specific slots for uh, video consultations throughout the day, but now more and more on our daily triage, we say we have somebody phoning in, then we would just either, rather than sending pictures in, which isn't so good, or we do there's time a place for that as well, but we would often phone, get the patient to phone back. And as I was chatting to Mark the other day, we find that the IT and the technology has improved. So by instead of having to say to the patient, please type in this, this website and this number by just clicking on to the, the uh, onto the actual, uh, putting the, sharing the text number, then that's made it so much easier. Um, so, so you know, all these things take time because obviously we've all been under huge pressure with the COVID and our triage list could be, we have about 7,000 patients, um, so our triage list could be pretty long, we could have about 40, 50, 60, 70 um, sometimes uh, to, to get through. But the secret, I think, is taking the time just reassuring the patient and the family uh, that actually, um, you know, this will work. We'll, we'll, you'll, we'll phone us back in, link in, and we can see and take a better history. It can never replace that hands-on um, clinical examination. And right at the beginning, I did have a, a young girl who had phoned, had come in, and we did a video consultation, and uh, she had a bit of a parotid, small parotid, almost tonsillar swelling, but, um, I spoke to my GP colleague, we had a look at it, thought, no, it doesn't look anything sinister, but I, and I always qualify it by saying, worst thing advice, phone back. Um, but, but um, and I did actually put her in my, my triage slot the following week, by which point the swelling had grown considerably. So I did big, bring her in and in fact, she had a cancer. So for me, I felt quite annoyed at myself because I think I've examined the patient the week before, although obviously things evolve. Um, but another example of a positive thing was we have a, a young boy who's who's very handicapped. He was a birth asphyxia and in his 20s. And it was at the time when, let's face it, we were all petrified about COVID last March and there was a reticence to go and visit uh, in the home. But um, we were able to do a video consultation and see this, this young boy who's got horrendous scoliosis. I could visualise that his breathing was quite laboured. He wasn't in acute distress, but um, rather than have to go and do a home visit, to save time, we, I was able to phone the hub at that point. Was it changed now? It's a smoother pathway. Speak to um, the nurse, the triage nurse there, we arranged a hospital admission um, that mum, who is his main carer, could go via e e with her mask. She was allowed to stay in with him and um, he, he had a week stay in. So that's just an example of, of uh, you know, one way to cut time and, and reduce infection control. So, um, yeah, I think maybe that's all I want to say if somebody wants to ask some questions and um, I'm, apologies because I've missed the beginning of this conference and I'm not sure what tack everybody else is on. <laughs> but that's OK, Pauline. Thank you very much for that. Now, that's that was really helpful to, to, to hear how uh, person centred it's been where you've been working, I think particularly around people being relaxed and reassured and, and taking the time to, to do that. Um, and again, <clears throat> you're honest about you know when 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 things <clears throat> don't quite go how you expect, and, and and that message about if things worsen, get back in touch, and we'll have another consultation. So then that's a really key thing to take home because yes. yeah, things do develop and things do look differently uh, as time progresses. Um, and again, that that use of near meter linking with colleagues for other opinions to help that family you know access those services. So you know lots of diverse uses for uh, for near me. So um, what I've like to do now is uh, just pass over to, to Rachel who's who's been monitoring the, uh, the Q&A and, and theming some things for us so um, what sort of questions are, are coming up Rachel? 
Uh, there is one question around the use of near me in small groups and just wanted to get a feel from the panel whether you have used near me in small groups, whether that be with small groups of patients or with patients and their parents or carers and how has that worked? Uh, Scott, we'll start off with you. Um, so Rachel, thanks. Uh, this was discussed quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> um, the, the theme of, of group consultations um, was discussed a lot, I think, at RCGP conference a couple of years ago that, that made quite a lot of headlines and um, particularly useful for those with uh, long term conditions, CPD, asthma, things like that. It, 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 there is some some evidence that patients certainly enjoy it and they, they, they do deliver reasonable outcomes. Um, with regards to the utility of it within near me, um, this was discussed as one of the early um, ways of, of supporting especially long term conditions through um, coronavirus restrictions. But I think also moving forward, um, I think for certain patients, it works really well for certain conditions. Um, I think the limit currently on number of, of, of attendees at once, I think is five or six. Um, Rachel, you'll be able to correct me there. Um, um, with regards to uh, the one thing I would highlight actually is the utility for multiple attendees for trainer, trainee, I'm a GP trainer. Um, so whilst my trainee is doing near me consultations, um, um, which um, one of them, um, in fact, she's, she's, she's very capable and didn't actually call me in that much, um, um, but um, the, the, the more junior ones did. Um, she was she was pregnant and in her third trimester and she was seeing most of the patients by near me um, um to be honest so um she didn't have to call me in that much but the, the young the, the more junior trainees do and you can just jump into the the call from the waiting room you can <clears throat> what would i say force entry almost them um, so you can see a consultation is being seen and you just click on it yourself as a trainer and, you know if your trainee messages you and says could you come and help me with this it's the exact same way that they they do it for a for, for another one, it, it could also be we didn't do it because um, we recorded them and we had methods to record them for her her exams and for her cots and things like that. But you could do it as an observed consultation as well. And you could turn off your camera and you could say to the patient, I'm just going to be here in the corner. I'll turn my camera off and, and you know, obviously get their consent and say that you're you're going to be observing it. Um, but you could do it as a three week consultation as long as the patient was aware of that in advance as a training practice and training practices have systems set up um, to make sure that patients are involved in those conversations and aware of what they're getting into. But it can work really well as a training tool as well, because I think that's something that um, um, is, you know, certainly the RCA just now, that's that's a big part of it uh, as to how they're doing it. They're doing recording in telephone in uh, on video consultation or or in, in person and or in, in tel telephone near me or or, or ter telephone video or or, or or in person. And so it is becoming a part of it almost. So as a training tool, I've, I've, I have liked it as well. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. And you were spot on with the numbers um, for group consultations. We do suggest around four or five, and it really does depend on your bandwidth as well. Uh, David, what have your experiences been like in, in perhaps having small groups within an EMA call? Uh, yeah, I think uh, pretty much the same as uh, Scott. I don't, we've certainly got no system whereby we're seeing multiple groups of patients but we have made use of the system for uh, we are training practice as well so exactly as Scott's describing uh, bringing in uh, a, a trainer to a, a trainee consultation or the other thing is sometimes transferring a call from one person to another so I'm in a video consultation with someone and they say, oh, do you know what? I saw the other doctor last week and we were talking about X, Y and Z. And I said, do you know what? He's in the other room. Why don't we just invite that person in and then I'll sign out? So you you move over to them. So we, we use the, the functionality in that way. But certainly the, the group patient thing is, is a new thing to me. I think we might look into that. Excellent. Thank you, David and Pauline. Yeah, I, I feel as though we're a bit of an infancy of this uh, down here and I really music to my ears. Um, I, the other thing when I was speaking to Mark and I'll be honest, I hadn't appreciated that assistance advice and, and further extended um, services voluntary uh, could, could be involved in it. But, but you know, I was sitting listening to you. So obviously we use Teams for say a social work case review, but I would like to see us using, yes, definitely a bit more group, but also um, perhaps social work and ourselves, you know, perhaps because the communication barriers are there. It's tricky. It's tricky. We're all under stress. Now we've got the COVID vaccinations that you're tending just to be kind of pushing on. So so I, I but I'm also learning things from you both here, David and, and Scott, about that, because I don't think it's actually something we've done here as a training practice. So I'm going to take that on board straight away. Yeah. So thank you. 
Thank you, Pauline. We have one question that's been put into the chat around um, there is interest um, to know the extent in which pharmacists in GP practices are using new me. Mm -hmm. Pauline, would you like to start with that one? Yeah, well, we have we are involved in helping train pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. And um, yes, yeah, so it's something I'm passionate about. And obviously did the independent prescribing, supplementary prescribing 2003, long time ago. So the pharmacy role I'm absolutely passionate about. And obviously they're an integral part of us. Um, we have a dedicated pharmacist with us, but actually, again, we haven't really, really used them as a as a resource for that. But at the moment, they're in a hub up the stairs, so they're not, not actually always based in the surgery. But again, I've written that down because that's something that uh, we can develop further. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Pauline. David, do any uh, pharmacists within your practice use NIME? Uh, we they don't. Uh, we share some pharmacists with uh, the part time here and part time in other surgeries, so they're moving around. And at the moment, we've actually got them uh, at the start of this this current lockdown. They're, they're working from home or working from elsewhere. So I'm I'm that's something that's really interesting to me, and I mm. think we need to start getting them onto mm. that. I mm. think a lot of their job because um, a lot of their job they they just don't physically need to be next to the patient at all. Um, they they're talking through things. They may be changing things on repeat prescriptions that aren't going to be you know, actually issued for another couple of weeks till that prescription's yeah. due up next month. So they don't need to physically be in the room, sign a prescription or anything. So yeah, it would be ideal for that. And that's something I think we'll take forward. Excellent. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? Um, the, the irony, it, it doesn't escape me, but the, the, that um, the pharmacist uh, colleagues have, have been slightly harder to reach, I have to say, through the program. Um, um, and the irony being, of course, that the the, the near me um, uh, previous lead was uh, is now, of course, the uh, um, I'm, I'm going to get her title wrong. So I'm so sorry, Claire, but I think she's uh, the director of Royal Pharmaceutical Society uh, in Scotland. Um, and so um, for their pharmacist credentials, um, not not managing to quite overcome that has been difficult. I think it's because I, uh, so my pharmacist downstairs, she's got the, uh, you know, she's got our, our login. And um, sorry, I say downstairs. I don't mean literally here. This is my house. Um, but um, um, downstairs within the practice. Um, my, so my pharmacist uh, does have access, and she's got camera, and she's got got the headset. But um, trying to impress upon them um, why it makes a difference when somebody's phoning up to the practice to discuss your medications and seeing somebody in person, and and why that makes a difference is still been quite hard. And likewise for community pharmacy as well. And we are getting there with community pharmacy, and we've we've told them about it, and we're starting to 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 increase that awareness and knowledge with them. But it's kind of like some of my GP colleagues, David. I don't know about yourself. Um, never speak ill of your colleagues, but trying to get them to to understand it from the other side as to why it makes a difference different to a telephone call has been um, more of a challenge than I thought it might be sometimes just to say, well, just, you know, and to use other, um, you know, uh, more abstract kind of examples, you know, think of it like FaceTime with your mum. You know, you always feel something different. You feel something a bit better. It feels like you gain something from that discussion with your mum on FaceTime that you wouldn't might have got uh, on a telephone call. There has to be a this understanding that, that there's something additional that you can gain from this call more than you will gain from a telephone call. And I found that quite challenging sometimes to 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 get to 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 bridge that gap with my pharmacist colleagues. But they are getting there and I know that they're they're learning about it and they are interested in trying to embrace it. I think Mark might have some specific examples that you can come in with. Yeah, over to you, Mark, and then David, I'll jump back to you after that. Yeah, in terms of um, in terms of pharmacy, we've had examples from pharmacists who who come commented and joined in our webinars. And uh, they were using uh, near me for their care home reviews where <clears throat> so basically um, people could show them the tablets. They didn't have to try and pronounce them or, or work out how to, to say them or spell them over the phone. They could show how many there were left. You know, if they were taking them properly, the, the thumbs could see actually, well, there's more in that blister pack than there should be. You know, or or why have you got none left? So so that the, it was a much richer dialogue that you could have as a pharmacist, gathering a, a bit more information about that that person's well-being that would guide prescriptions and and uh, medicine reviews. So so there's some good examples of of, of, of good quality pharmacy interventions there, um, and and also want to just pick up on groups as well. So as part of the NME network, we are doing some some targeted work at the minute on um, using 
digital platforms for groups and developing guidance and good practice. So um, we are hopeful that at some point we will have a unified platform in Scotland that will be suitable for groups up to 30 people. Um, so that's work in progress, um, but we're still working on the, 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 the actual platform that that's going to run on. But we, but alongside that, we need to be making sure we've got people got good guidance and good support to, to run it. Because running a group digitally is very different to running a face to face group um, and different skills required, but massively helpful to people that have missed out on face to face groups in this last year or so. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks for that update, Mark. David, back over to you. Uh, yeah, I, it's been when we first started using the technology, it was very much sold to us as a one to one. You've got a doctor at one end and a patient at the other end. And it's been a real eye opener to me to hear other people using it for, you know, we, we already were using it for training purposes, but pharmacists or, and such like. Um, another group we were thinking of, and it's possibly slightly uh, out there, and I don't know how my colleagues would take to this, is uh, we, we were thinking of having another um, wait, uh, another virtual waiting room and opening it up to receptionists. Because at the moment, patients, well, in the old days, patients used to walk in off the street, they would find themselves physically in front of the reception desk mm -hmm. and they could talk to the receptionist. Uh, and we were toying with the idea of if we had a second waiting room for the practice, patients could just pitch up, uh, you know, just join the, the near me system without an appointment and a receptionist would be, I don't know how they would feel about that, just be sitting in front of a video screen all day <coughs> and uh, people would arrive in the waiting room and they could just do the usual, hello, how are you and what can we do for you? Oh, you'd like to make an appointment or do this, that and the other. And actual, the same things as they do currently with a phone call, only with a... Uh, uh, only with a video, but that's a big move to unsolicited video calls, but it's something we were thinking of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. And that's a really good point, David. I know that a lot of outpatient services have, have used that reception model to really welcome, I guess, welcome the patient and really make it look like that physical setting, but in a virtual way. So I'm really interested to see how you go about that in the GP setting. Uh, there is a just to add to the pharmacy question. This might be this is a very specific example, but if have any of your community pharmacists or pharmacists in your practice uh, use near me for smoking cessation services and GFFS annual reviews? I think. Uh, so we have a smoke and cessation uh, service up in our primary care centre and I do know that the smoking counsellors, cessation counsellors do that, um, do use it. I am not aware of that service through the pharmacy that I know of, but yeah. Scott or David, do you have anything on um, to in, add to that? In Ayrshire, the, all the uh, nicotine replacement and such like is done via the community pharmacies, so we don't have any involvement in that. Uh, the gluten free, we haven't done that, but we did do a few other annual reviews over um, uh, over, over near me, and I think that would work perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I wouldn't see a problem with that. Mm -hmm. No examples, Rachel, but I would strongly encourage it. That is what I yeah. would say. So I, I think locally I have spoken to my um, community pharmacy link colleagues um, about it. Um, it's definitely it's definitely really positive. It's it's uh, absolutely um, the, our experience is, is 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 something that we should build upon. And um, you know when you're getting offered it for your your outpatient appointments and things like that, I think I think we're going to start to get to a point where people are going to start to. Um, have adverse opinions when we when we don't offer it, if that makes sense for for that. You know, I wish to interact with the community pharmacy in this way. Um, can I not do that at your at your community pharmacy um, um, or at your GP practice? Heaven forbid. And certainly down south, we saw that as an example um, in in some of our southeast uh, uh, London, you know, kind of colleagues where where big chunks of practices went and registered with um, online only providers. Um, I think that's a horrible way to have an interaction with your GP exclusively online because there will be a time when you need to see them in person or when you're more unwell or when you're more frail. So it's it, it needs to be a very blended model where that's there as a solution when you need that as a solution. Um, uh, but it's not it's not for all the time, but it's for the times that you, you've, you, you'd prefer it and it seems to match the need. Excellent. Thank you, Scott, for that. Uh, there is a question around how do you support and perhaps even encourage patients to use Near Me? Um, are there any tips or tools that you use in your practice to help with that? 
Scott, we'll hand over to you. You're nodding. <laughs> yeah, that's, my, it's, it's, that's one of my favourite questions, um, Rachel, and, and it's a really good question. Thanks for asking. Um, I, for those that, that not represented on this call, we have had them on other national calls. Um, um, my admin colleagues um, um, are the, the keystone to this. This is a collaborative effort and a practice. A whole practice has to be kind of signed up to this because um, it, it's in my practice, it's the default first offering. If somebody says, um, oh, can I speak to a doctor at some point um, in the next week? Um, um, about um, a routine medical issue. Absolutely. Um, we have a near me video appointments if you wish to use that. Um, you can use telephone if you wish to. Um, and it's the routine first line offering. Um, you know, um, and why is that? It's because you know we, we value the ability to see them in person and I think they value it as well. Um, so we want to make sure that it's there and we have the capacity for it in pre-booked appointments and we do. Um, and so our, our my admin colleagues are the first line of that. They offer it um, there um, to let patients know that it's, uh, it's available and um, we had it on our telephone messages for a while before this there's apparently there's some vaccination thing ongoing just now that uh, take over the current telephone messaging I can't remember what it is but um, um, we did have it there as a default as well it's on you know and so being there as a your admin colleagues are key to this really are and they've got to make sure that they understand it so that they can explain it if there are any problems they, they're the first point of of fielding that. Some practices adopt a method by which admin even go into the calls as the patients arrive, welcome them, make sure that they're OK, that they're set up, that their camera's working, that they can hear, and, and then the, 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 the admin can leave the call, but it's still kind of left in the waiting room. And that's perfectly possible for practices that are unsure about it. I have to say it's not a big issue for us. We, 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 we were considering it, but have agreed, decided not to commit the admin to that because there's just so many successful calls and people are getting more and more familiar with it. But I think if you wanted that reassurance or you had a bad day and um, you might come out of your room and say, right, we need an admin to do this because I'm just, you know, two of them or three of them in a row. I ended up phoning because um, this these things happen sometimes, you know, um, but, you know, the numbers speak for themselves about the number of successful calls. Um, so um, admin are the key in my, in my 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 humble opinion there, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Now that's a really great advice to get the admin team involved. We've mm -hmm. learnt from some other practices that <clears throat> having the admin team do some test calls with patients prior to the appointment can also be really useful. Maybe when they start when they book that appointment, just to know that their system and their technology is working and it also builds their confidence. Uh, Pauline, I'll hand over to you on the tips. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just. Again, interesting to hear everybody's um, thoughts. And I often think about sort of almost the inequality of the, the elderly or the patients who don't have a smartphone or an iPhone. These are often the ones who really could benefit. You know, so we have a 25 mile ra round radius of, of practice uh, and boundaries, and a lot of them are elderly. And unless I'm missing a trick here, there is no way to get do the video consultation on a landline. Am I right? Is is that yeah? I'm not <laughs> crazy. So is that something that's been looked at or is that really a huge problem <laughs> to fix? Yeah, unfortunately, you do need to have a video camera to use near me. It won't open up without the video camera yeah. as well as a speaker a activated. Good question, but <laughs> no, yeah. any all questions welcome? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, David, do you have anything to add? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's like all things in medicine, it's never going to be good for absolutely everyone. And you, you have to have a, a variety of um, choices. There has to be a menu. You know, we can offer you, uh, much like uh, Scott, we try to um, say this is our first choice with like a video call. And oh, you can't do that. Well, we can do a phone call. Well, we can't do that. OK, well, and I guess, you know, there's, we could bring you in or we could visit you. And that there has to be a menu. And hopefully for every single person, then some people would be suitable for two or three different modalities. There will always be people who can only do one particular thing, whether that's their you know, by choice or but not not by choice. But there will always be such people, and as long as we have a, a as long as we have some way of dealing with it, better. But I would thoroughly agree if we can encourage people to um, to, and I think as well that, that society in general over the last year has moved towards. You know, lots of people are doing video conferencing that never used to. I suspect a large part of that problem will take care of itself. But yeah, we do need to reach out to these people. Yes. Thank you. And I think that's all the questions for today. So I'll hand back over to you, Mark.
Okay, thank you. And again, just to pick on a couple of themes around, you know, uh, very acutely aware of the, the impacts of digital poverty and, and, and connecting Scotland are looking to try and narrow that gap so there are so that people who are hard to reach have got access to either a device or broadband or they can make their way to somewhere where they could, whether that's a community centre or a library or uh, their, their GP practice, you know, so there's, but it is, it's not, it's not, there's always going to be people that are going to be, you know, on the very outer limits of, of connectivity and, and trying to um, uh, connect with those people. I would also just share what one of our other practices shared in one of the other webinars was where they they supported their admin and reception staff with some fairly um, clear scripting to help them differentiate between what, what would be a good type of patient need that would lend itself to a phone call versus, versus a video call versus a face-to-face. -face. And, and I think that reassured and gave the admin and, and reception staff some confidence in, in, in filtering out, you know, who can we schedule in for face-to-face -face or who would be better for a video or a telephone call. So, and again, that's something I think that Rachel and I were keen to kind of look into a bit further and see how we can support, you know, primary care. Because as, as everyone has said, it's very much a team approach. It's a collaborative effort and um, a, a across the whole practice. So uh, what I would like to do is I have just going to put into the Q&A uh, Hang on a sec. A wee link to a survey that we'd be very grateful if you could fill in based on your experience of the webinar today, but also finding out a little bit more about how we could support you in your future use of Near Me as a network. So it's only five questions long, it takes about a minute and a half to complete. So it'd be great if we could uh, get some feedback on that. What I'm going to do for fear of, of not being able to see the slides and what's going on in the, in the thing, I would ask Rachel if you could put the um, nearme.scot links for the, and the text site links into the, the Q&A chat as well, would that be okay? And what we'll do is we'll make sure all of this is contained in the resource pack that you receive uh, following this webinar. Um, so I suppose what, what uh, all we need to do now really is just to thank you for joining us this afternoon in your busy schedules, thank our speakers for taking the time out of their schedules to share the valuable work they're doing and, and how they're, they're trailblazing the use of Near Me and hopefully um, give other people some inspiration and some support about how to um, embed it and roll it out where they work. Uh, and again, it's been great to hear about the variety of use across primary care and also the, 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 the breadth of interactions that, that have been had with patients accessing primary care to meet their needs. So, um, so yes, there'll be in the chat, there'll be some information on the websites that we have and um, you'll get a video recording link for today's session uh, in the next couple of days.